Hello, B here, and welcome back to a brand new unit in biology. Now that you know all about chromosomes and DNA, it's time to put that knowledge into action and see how chromosomes are inherited by offspring from their parents, giving their bodies all the instructions they need to survive, as well as their visible traits. The science of how traits are passed on from one generation to the next is called genetics. And this will be our topic for the next few lessons. As we study genetics, it will be very important to remember what you learned in the last unit about DNA, and especially the process of meiosis. If you don't remember the names of all the steps in meiosis, that's okay. But what you absolutely have to know for any of this unit to make sense is what the end product of meiosis is and how it relates to the other cells in your body. Your reproductive cells, or gametes, only contain half of your DNA because they are made through meiosis. So if you decide to have children someday, they will get exactly half of your chromosomes. The other half of their chromosomes will come from the gamete of their other parent. And which half they get from each of you is totally random. You may remember from Unit 1 that sections of chromosomes are called genes and that they code for specific proteins, which in turn give us specific traits. For every gene, you have two copies, one from each parent. Each of these copies is called an allele, and the combination of alleles you have for any gene determines which trait you show. We'll look at a couple of examples of interesting genes and alleles in organisms today. Have you ever seen a lobster? What color are lobsters? I bet you said brown or red. The vast majority of lobsters are brown, but turn red when they are cooked. Have you ever seen a blue lobster? They are rare, but I promise this is a real picture. How do a small number of lobsters end up being blue? Remember that in the last unit, we talked about genetic mutations or changes to the DNA? Well, it turns out that there is a mutation in the blue lobster's DNA that causes them to overproduce a protein that gives the blue color. And it is possible that the mutation will be passed on to any offspring that the blue lobster has. But will all of the blue lobster's offspring be blue? Not likely. In fact, it is unlikely that the blue lobster will have any blue offspring. In order to be blue, the lobster must have gotten the mutated allele from both parents. So the only way to guarantee that our blue lobster has blue lobster babies is for it to mate with another blue lobster. Great plan, except that they are so very rare. It's highly unlikely that our little blue wonder here will ever even see another blue lobster. So how are blue lobsters ever born? Well, it's just luck. There are a small number of lobsters out there, thought to be about one in 1,000, that do have one allele for the blue condition. You would never know it just by looking at them though, because most of them appear as the more typically seen brown color. But if they happen to mate with another secretly carrying the blue allele lobster, there is a chance that their offspring could get the blue allele from both of them and be blue. So if you are ever lucky enough to see one, you've witnessed the power of genetics and probability. Unfortunately, not all inherited mutations have a fun effect like blue color. Another example of a mutation is found in humans called sickle cell anemia. If an individual inherits a sickle cell allele from both parents, their blood cells will not produce enough hemoglobin this affects the shape of the blood cells and prevents them from being able to carry enough oxygen to the body. Those living with sickle cell anemia experience frequent pain, swelling, and infections. Sickle cell is just one of many diseases that can be inherited as missense mutations from the parents, resulting from one single nucleotide base being switched. What makes it unique, however, is the case where you only receive one copy of the sickle cell allele. We said that to have sickle cell anemia, you have to get the allele from both parents. 
What if you only get the mutated allele from one parent? Some of your cells would be misshapen, but not enough to cause any real problems, and you probably wouldn't experience many symptoms, if any at all. Okay, that doesn't seem too unusual. One allele with the expected trait and one with the mutation lands you somewhere in between. Strangely enough though, it was found that the sickle cell allele was almost completely absent in most parts of the world, except places where malaria is commonly spread. Malaria is a serious disease caused by a parasite and often spread through mosquito bites. It became known that those with the middle condition of sickle cell, having one sickle cell allele and one allele without, had significantly higher immunity to malaria. That's probably why the allele stuck around in those populations. It was actually an adaptation. But only if you get exactly one sickle cell allele, not two. The study of genetics is full of all sorts of interesting cases like this unexpected results in offspring, and traits being inherited together that would seem unrelated. As we go through the unit, we'll look at the mechanisms behind these examples, and you'll learn to predict the outcome for offspring knowing what genetics the parents have to offer. Attached to this lesson is the PDF for the entire unit. You'll want to make sure you read the additional information found there and work through the practice problems in the PDF before taking the lesson assessments. As always, the PDF for each individual lesson can be found after the video lesson, but it's often easiest to go ahead and print it out or download it now so you have it ready. We'll learn about all sorts of tools we can use to study genetics and predict outcomes in this unit. But until then, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. Hey.